Oh <laughs> my gosh. You want to talk about scared? I was scared earlier. I was so scared that I was almost naked and afraid. <laughs> You want to talk about scared? I was scared earlier. I was so scared that I was almost naked and afraid. <laughs> First, I'm going to introduce the great Mark Giordino, writer, producer, director, and award-winning filmmaker of Behind the Gate, which you can see at BehindTheGateMovie.com. And next, and without further delay, Manu Toigo. Mm -hmm. How you doing? Boy, you clean up nice. Don't I? Uh, you clean up sweet. You may know, Manu, from a show that was uh, uh, it's, it's a hit. It's called Naked and Afraid. And like you, dear viewer, I felt like a, a monster tuning in to watch that just to see uh, naked hindquarters and possible breasts without blurs until I saw the show. Wow, what an amazing program. You take people out of their natural habitat drop them somewhere in the wild and say good luck no clothes no food no water no tools just one a knife a one you each person gets, gets one tool one tool and you don't know what tool what you're tool going you get? to get uh, of course i um i made it very clear that i was in love with my ontario machete right and uh thank god that they chose that particular yeah. tool for so me. one tool yeah, just one tool. They talked to my second ex-wife, and they said, what tool do you, she, do you have? And she said, him. <laughs> True story. That's why she's my ex-wife. <laughs> I'm holding a copy of Firepower Magazine, which I'm going to hold up here. Firepower Magazine. And inside, there is a great spread on you called Against All Odds. Yes. And that's because you are a weapons expert. So you didn't go into this this whole thing, you know, without any, you know, previous knowledge of how to survive in the wild. No, absolutely not. Um, you know, my affiliation with the weapons started from being on a farm and then going into the military. And uh, several years ago, I started working in special operations training. So that got me close to all the, the mist of weapons that are out there. And um, What's your fascination with men? My fascination yeah, with men? Yeah, what's your men? fascination with men? The fact that I can hang with them. Oh, man. I have so way hot. more fun with men than I do Who doesn't? hanging around women. Who doesn't? Women can women be a little Women are catty, catty and mean. And... Yeah, why are they like that? I'll tell you why they're like why? that. Because they're not like Manu. Yeah. That's because true. she's confident exactly. and powerful and knows what she wants. And life throws it her way, including the struggles and challenges that come along with being who you are. Ah. <sighs> I've had plenty of that, too. I'm going to tell you, I have one real gift in life, and I got it when I was very young. It's the, oh, I yeah, thought you were going to say me. I was going to say you, but I'm going to switch that answer up. It's the ability to make anyone cry. I can make people feel. It's like an empath, and then when they begin to feel, they begin to cry. And, and people think crying is sad. Crying is not sad. Crying is the beginning of healing. Yeah, it's a very cleansing procedure. I'm going to see you cry. Oh. But it's also a, a great way to connect because 100%. You, you're really making that connection 100%. that ultimate connection yeah. i didn't hug you long enough when i met you no you didn't when i come back big, went, oh you can get your arms around I, me I, I didn't even get a hug well you you because you, you ran away well don't worry stop I'm gonna, touching me i'm gonna i'm gonna get what's coming <laughs> I'm i want you to know something we all got it coming guaranteed <laughs> So, I'm here with Manu Toigo. What a great... What's your middle name? Michelle. Oh. Uh, See, I happen to love women. <laughs> I just... Women oh, are, I can tell. I love women. <laughs> well, the women, women are the better 
they're the better half of everything in the world. So let's say you have an orange. You peel the orange, the woman is the orange and the peel is the man. He's what you discard. They're the, they're the, when you crack a nut, right, a beautiful pecan, and you crack it, what you discard is the shell. That's the man and the nut is the woman. They're the, they're the best half of everything in the world, period. And by the way, you look more handsome with her sitting next to you. How could I not? <laughs> See? I don't make this stuff up. <laughs> so, Naked and Afraid, you are cast on the show with one guy who really knows what he's doing. Two guys, actually, who knew what they were doing yes. as survivalists. And then this dingy blonde broad, and I'm not going to speak ill of her because I don't know her condition, but she had no place out there, but yet she lasted until the end. When I know that many people fail on those shows because it is just tough going. I mean, to have nothing, what's your biggest enemy when you're out there against the, the elements? I think the the biggest complication or, or the the main challenge that we did face every single day was our exposure because we were unclothed and in particular no shoes. That alone became um, the biggest concerns every single day from the heat, from the cold, um, from cuts, bruises, thorns going into our feet and uh, particularly going in through the jungle, you know, your first line of defense is your clothing. Mm -hmm. So when you're going through this horrid, it's one of the worst notorious jungles around the world. It's That's what it's known and for. And see, people see it and they think because there's water and cliffs and nice vistas that, oh, oh. this is going to be great. Oh, no. I, I go to the beach here, right? I wear a tuxedo. You know, I'm not getting, <laughs> I got to be comfortable on the beach. I don't like right. that stuff going in there. And, and, and imagine you guys walking out with no clothes. And I understand the, the premise of the show. One, it's salacious because you're seeing naked women for the women and for the men, you know, uh, for the uh, vice versa for the, for, the, for the men. But there's also the challenge of just being so resilient, relying it's, on yourself only. Absolutely. How do you d dig down deep enough to, to, to make that, that 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 leap um ultimately you know anyone faced up against any challenge any survival situation it's all the mind it's all in the mind it's the mind becomes such a powerful tool it it can be your number one tool that you have to rely on in any circumstance whether you're doing survival or whether you're dealing on an everyday issue or the challenges that we face every single day it's how we perceive it in our mind and it's and and if you can um, if you can commit to yourself that you can overcome any challenge or and face the fears and face the adversities that you come across every day you can accomplish anything that you put your mind to. The mind is such a powerful tool. And believe me, with all my experience in the military and at all the training that I've done, the number one thing that I have relied on is my mind, how strong my mind is to get me through everything that I've done. What, I, I agree with you there, uh, I have a very weak mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> However, what was the biggest challenge that you faced uh, in the survival thing? What, what was the most difficult thing for you to uh, uh, continue to overcome or that presented itself to you? Is there anything that singled itself out as being something that you probably were maybe the least expecting or the least prepared to deal with? Um, no, because I have a good understanding, you know, of, of how my body reacts when I go into survival situations, you know, in, in the field that is. And the, the way I prepared was one for about a few weeks before going on the show, I just walked barefoot everywhere I went. The other thing is I'm, I'm paleo, which means I don't eat any um, wheats, flowers or anything like that. It's just strictly raw vegetables, meats non-processed foods, things like that, something that you would naturally find in the, in the wild. And also, um, you, in, in, instead of, a lot of people have this perception 
that they need to eat and put on as much weight as they possibly can before they go out. And my thinking is, is it's probably the wrong way to tackle it because what you're doing is you're expanding your stomach so far that it's used to having this pile of food in it. You cut it down to very, very small portions on a daily basis, then you're going to get full on a couple of mouthfuls of, of coconut, so to speak. Yeah. So yeah, see, I would, I would, and, I would miss potato chips. I'd have to yeah. have some chips when I went on the street. See, that's well, we where would crab. I hide them? Though? I want to wait, wait, wait. I we wanna, had swamp crab chips. Yeah. Wow. Wait, 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 wait. Don't go any further because I want people to hear this. And I don't want to gloss <laughs> over it. When we come back, we're going to talk about that because that's very important. What are the small things? You mentioned that you're a, a paleo. Paleo. Pa a paleo. paleo. You don't, paleo. Yeah. My second ex-wife was a deleterian. We'll be right <laughs> back. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. We're talking to Manu Toygo. <laughs> Manu, Manu. And of course, the great Mark Giordino. You mentioned oh, potato yeah. chips that you couldn't I'm live without. Mark. You couldn't live without chips. Well, I, I, I couldn't live without them, but I'm going to bring some with me. And you said something <laughs> about, what was it, crab chips? What'd you say? Uh, Russell and I, at one, with the, the first main fire that we got, our food source of protein was these little tiny mud crabs that right. we found in the jungle swamps. Right. So um, we would spear them and then cook them on the, uh, over the fire. Right. And believe me, they just tasted like crispy crab cakes. Oh. They were awesome. Yeah. They were, mm. they were actually really good. What was the, I want I, there were some horrible things that we're going to discuss, but I want to know what was the absolute best thing on a daily basis for being stranded out in that experience, what was the, because I know there's got to be a good part. For me, mm -hmm. it was connecting with nature. Mm -hmm. Like knowing every day I made a point of a little bit of meditation mm -hmm. and acceptance that, that where I was, I'm going to learn from. I'm learning something very invaluable for the rest of my life. And um, I have this, uh, a deep love for, for forestry, for animals, and just the unknown, so to speak. So it was nature for me, just okay. being enclosed and all that. And it was, it was, um, I'll be kind to her, and she'll be kind to me. Right. Any tree that I cut down or vine I had in my mind is like, thank you for giving me this, you know, giving this to me mm -hmm. for my survival. And so, uh, that's just the way that I've always interacted. See, with, I'm a little bit life. different. And I don't, <laughs> you're laughing, but I almost feel like everything was put here for us. I really do. I know people, I, I had a girlfriend once, she goes, let's go hug this tree. I go, let's chop it down and make some firewood, lay down by the fire, right? <laughs> I feel like it's here for us. Now, how we treat it, whether with respect or with disrespect, that's a, that's a different issue, but... I would submit to you that everything there was put there for you to use. Oh, well, every absolutely. vine, every crab. I think the difference is, is that in well, general, the difference many is people she... abuse instead of use. Exactly, right, right. exactly, abuse instead right. of use. They, they and, have and, no and, concept of, of you know, you, you just don't go out there and start chopping down trees just because it's like, oh, this is a well, great. Well, the, the reason you know, I say that is the one character on the show that before you guys cross. Uh, and, and met everyone. Right. He killed an animal and he couldn't use it. No. He killed a, what was it, an aardvark or something? Uh, I believe it was an anteater. An aardvark, yeah. An, yeah. And, and, and he, he killed it uh, and, he, and he cuts it up and it, it spoiled. He couldn't use it. He couldn't use no. the fur. He could. He goes, I feel so bad that I've killed this animal and I can't even eat it. Because well, he, he couldn't. He, he could tried. Have, he could have used he the fur. Yeah. He could have used the fur. Yeah. But, you know, the rule of thumb is just that you do not kill any animal that requires, you know, a good-sized fire to right. cook. If you don't have the fire, he had no fi how, he had nothing, how are yeah. you going to do that? Yeah. You know, so the best thing is to stick with the fish because yeah. you can eat fish raw. Well, he couldn't capture any fish. And, and yeah. one thing that I really loved about the show was it showed just how visceral and how unforgiving life is, you know, oh, and, and yeah. how dicey it is because... You you know you get up in the morning you have your orange juice you have your suit and you go through but I was I hung out with a homeless guy for a while and I said what's the most important what's what's important he goes well 
if you can just get five dollars a day, if you can, if five bucks a day is different between life and death. And it, that that shocked me to hear that it was that it only took that much to exist and to, to thrive, really. Right. But when you're in the conditions that you're in, it's not an issue of money or 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 uh, that type of collateral. It's a matter of mental and physical and, and, and creative collateral. I was just about to bring that up because let's hear it. A lot of you know you had to utilize a lot of creativity into coming up with um, okay. There's a massive river that is going by us, but we can't drink that because we can yeah, get not, sick yeah. from it. Right. But we had the rainfalls every day, heavy rainfalls. Yeah. So from the palms that I did cut, yeah. I kept the trunks that I used as a guttering system yep. into the coconut shells. Right. So that was one way that we did. And the other thing, um, and, and there were no um, rock cliffs where we could find a seep hole from or, you know, like through the crevice. Right. Uh, but we also dug a seep hole, you know, so many feet away from the river. But that was a little time consuming and, and yeah. it took a lot more effort. Yeah, better to collect the rain and drink from the from the containers you can create with the with the coconut. Yeah, absolutely. How, how fast do you get tired of coconut when you're <laughs> stuck in a... Um, very, very fast. Uh, actually, it was more the palm hearts, you know, even from the palms that we cut. Mm -hmm. You can eat the, the center of the palms. Right. Um, that there became more difficult to chew down every day because it's just so bland. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's not like the palm hearts you can buy in the stores. What do you want to ask? You got well, no, I was, well, I assumed with the coconuts that there's a lot of coconut, there was coconut cream pie somewhere, I say. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... What I wanted to ask is, how far did you move from your initial location during the course of the day? I mean, did you all base camp in one spot and move out during the day, but base camp back? Yeah, you know? well, wherever we built that shelter, that was our primary um, residence. residence. Yeah. And uh, Russell was, was really great in going out and trying to find coconuts. We found one tree that was loaded with coconuts but they were all up there. And every other coconut that we found, I think one out of six was good to eat. Mm. And, oh, they and, had and fallen? The ones that had fallen. You know, once they're down on the swamp, on the swamp floor, you know, they would rot and ugh. And, and then of course the wild pigs, they'd come along and they'd eat them too. We had the wild pigs come through our camp. And of course the howling monkey that came right on top of us one night, because mm -hmm. he was a little um, distressed that we were there in his own territory. See, I would have taken the howler monkey and beat one of the pigs to death and then roasted some ribs. <laughs> I got to I don't have a lot of sympathy for for I I'll tell you I, I saw a street fight one day. Horrible street fight. And after the fight, these two guys came over to one of the guys who was in the fight. And I swear to you, this guy lifted his nose and he sniffed the air, and I said, what in the world is he doing? He goes, and he looks at the two guys, he goes, I know who you are, get away from me. They were with the other group, but you couldn't tell. And this guy's instincts for survival were so strong, strong. even in that condition. Right. He just, I was like, wow. There is something to being human which dictates survival. You must survive. So there's a reason you were able to chop down the trees and the vines, even though you thanked them. The reason you're able to put those crabs in that fire, yeah. there's a certain amount of human cruelty to survival, uh, well, to yeah. everything that's around uh, it. Abso absolutely. Well, you, something's um, got to perish for something to survive. Well, I mean, I'm going to say that's that, yeah, world I don't that's mean true. perish, I mean total destruction. Well, I can, I can honestly say that the area that Russell and I were in, mm -hmm. because we, we pretty much cleared out I would imagine that yeah. entire area yeah. for our shelter with the vines you know all the palms and I know I look back at it and it's like wow, wow what did we just do what did I I mean this is yep. all just for a, a shelter and you destroyed every and little did, ecosystem and it was and, like wow yeah, what yeah. did I do but like you said you know it it was what was required required oh I don't think it was required I think it was mandatory well, for survival no no, for humanity. See, you could have survived in a lot smaller space with a lot less impact on that environment. In my mind, right? Possibly. Like, like the other guy didn't have to kill that aardvark. Right. Like that, you know. There was so many things that didn't need to happen, but I, I submit to you, they absolutely had to happen. 
I think, the, and we're going to talk about well, it when we come yeah. back, because there's something about humanity, and I want to talk to you about it, because you're superhuman. You don't want to talk to me about it. I can't talk no, to you no, about I it. Just, you, no, I'm just gonna, <laughs> making a play. Because I mean, you're going to want <laughs> chips and coconut cream pie, and now if I'm it's hungry. Available, if it's available, I'm going to take a available, slice. You know? <laughs> I gotta show you something. Relax. So what? We had a falling out. That's past. Now's the time for friends. But this is not how much I owe you. I can't do this alone. I need you. Where were you? I can't escape my mind From a broken bow Fall into finite space Wow, man. I only have two words for you. Toy go. <laughs> Sounds like a great cinematic villain, Toy Go. It's Russian a great assassin. Name. It is. Yeah, I'm I'm proud my father gave me that. Is it so we were talking about human destruction, which I find to be amazing because I'm looking at this magazine that says firepower. Yeah. And then I flip to your picture in this thing. And you're aiming at something. You're going to kill something. Talk to me a little bit about how destruction plays a part in your existence on this planet. Because you said you want to hang with the boys. And boys are destructive. Boys make bombs and rockets and yeah, grenades and, and, and all these too. things. But I see this picture right here. I see that picture. I don't mean to mangle your magazine. But you're not dressed for the ball. No. You look like you're going to go take out a couple of Al-Qaeda operatives and then eat a eat an ice cream sundae. So talk to me about what, what part does that play in your existence? Um, interesting. Don't be, yeah, it is interesting. Interesting. Because, I guess because I've always, I've always gone for things that ultimately it's been men. It's, it's men orientated and, mm -hmm. and so on because I feel like I have the, the strength and durability to be able you to. You got a nice mouth too. Oh. Isn't it gorgeous? It's beautiful, hey. man. I got a little story about that oh, one. I'd like to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've, I've always, um, you know, I've always come across uh, to men as being one of them. Mm -hmm. and, and I was a tomboy growing up, so, I always, you know, right from a little gal, like, here I am shooting guns and already building shelters, not even having a clue that this was actually essentially you know, was, primitive style. Well, was there a sense of wanting to prove that you could do things that maybe other people felt you yeah, couldn't? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I, I tell you why. <laughs> My first part of the school, you know, like from year one mm -hmm. through to year six, mm -hmm. it was very traumatic for me. Uh, the headmaster of that school physically and emotionally abused me for seven years. Wow. And he made me feel like I was the most worthless, wow. worthless piece of in this entire world. So that, that destroyed me, you know, as a young child growing up and trying to become educated and trying to feel good mm -hmm. about myself mm -hmm. and who I am. And because we were in such a, a very small community too, that kind of spread out everywhere in the community. Oh my God! So I become, I became the rebel. I became the nasty one. I became the tough one. I became the bully. And and it wasn't until later on I was like, I'm going to join the military. I'm going to join the military because that kind of flowed on mm -hmm. as my way of. Um, 
rebuilding myself, mm -hmm. the confidence. And right. th that was basically the, one of the main reasons why I did go back or why I did go into the military. Plus, when I was a child, because we were so isolated during the, the cyclones, we used to have a, the helicopters come in and drop food supplies. Right. And I'd be like, man, I want to do that. So this is all coming Where from Where in Australia here. were you that they're dropping food off? Uh, in the far northeast region of Queensland, in the sugarcane farms. Oh my God! So we were we were very isolated. You know, no hospital or it, it wasn't just down the road that we could go to a shop. You know, and this was miles away. I'm I'm not a doctor, but I did sleep in a in a Hilton last night, which kind of gives me credibility, street cred. <laughs> That's an advertising <laughs> campaign. Well, if you sleep in you the just dropped a bomb. You just dropped a bomb yeah. on my really? show. Yeah, because you know this whole thing about abuse, this whole thing about bullying and and, and destruction. Yeah. Of women, especially. I mean, you see it with men, just not to the same degree. But what is going on that that men feel, feel that they can just take? and destroy. I find that to be very interesting. That's a very good question. That's a good thought that everyone should be thinking about. I think it comes down to one thing. Ego. I think well, it's all yeah, ego, man. Definitely, I think it, I definitely. can take it. If I can take it, I can take but it. But also remember, in, in this society, when young boys are growing up into men, they're really trying to find their footing and where they belong in a very male-dominated business world. It's changing a little bit, but when we look at it and the reality of it, who powers the world? It's, it's men. So, in my opinion... See, I disagree it, with you 100%. I, I, don't, know, I don't think men control anything. But in my opinion, anything. there's so much more pressure on men to prove who they are or what they can be. I disagree totally. See, I, I don't think men run anything. I think men are in charge of hunting and gathering. Oh, well, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a true. fact. But I think they're hunting, hunting and gathering for someone else. They're not going bringing it back to the table of their own making. Because no. if that was the case, we'd all be eating beans. <laughs> it's what makes me tick. It's like what makes me keep on walking forward. It's like, Maybe yep, you should I talk do that, for a while. I'm going to keep on doing it. Maybe you should talk for a while and take it easy and let life just cradle you and hold you. How would that be? Could you stand that? Could you Probably stand not. luxury? Could you stand? Would that be okay for you? And that's how we roll.